Hello, Deserving Listeners. Today we have a special guest on the podcast, Dr. Judy Grizel. She's a professor of psychology at Bucknell University, and she recently published a book about addiction and neuroscience. Please introduce yourself to podcast land, please. So I'm a basic scientist. I do behavioral pharmacology and genetics, but I'm also a recovering drug addict. I hit bottom in my early 20s, went to treatment, thought I would cure addiction, which is why I became a neuroscientist. 20 years later, you know, hadn't gotten that far and nobody had. So I wrote this book called Never Enough, The Neuroscience and Experience of Addiction. And it's marrying what we know about the brain and also experience. And it went to the New York Times bestseller list and was, I was interviewed with by Terry Gross and Science Magazine and lots of things. I got to the World Economic Forum as a speaker. You know, lots of good things happened. And I'm working on new books now, but that's the gist of it. This is a big question. What's the cause of addiction? Well, that is a big question. I think there are three main factors. So we could divide the causes, I guess, into three main streams. About half of the risk is inherited. And this seemed like a simple thing, especially once we clone the human genome, we figured we'll just pick out those genes. But we now think there are probably thousands of genetic variations that influence your liability, either to increase or decrease it. So it's been really complicated to find those. And the biggest ones that have been found are uh, ones that relate to metabolism of particular substances. So they're not even in the brain, which is kind of boring. Uh, There are a few variants that have been found in the brain. There's one, for instance, that has a pretty big influence on nicotine addiction, and that uh, happens to be uh, coding for a subunit of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which is one of the Recep, you know, is a receptor that's responsible for nicotine's actions. And, um, but mostly that's been uh, frustrating looking at the genetics. The second big stream is environment, of course. So we talk about nature and nurture. And uh, if anything, the environment's more complex. So there aren't any smoking guns again. Um, in fact, the biggest contribution from the environment is kind of random noise, as it usually is. But Uh, You know, it could be things like your family environment, your neighborhood, your access and opportunity, your culture, those sort of things. But the most potent factor, I think, is this third stream, which kind of supersedes both of the nature and nurture, and that is developmental exposure. So it turns out that the best predictor of problem use with drugs is picking up before you're 18, which is of course when most people pick up because kids are prone to risk and uh, you know they like novel experiences and they don't listen to authority. So it's like kind of a perfect storm. It's a, it's a time in development. And because kids learn everything better and addiction is a form of learning, taking drugs early is um, a good way to develop a problem. So we could say that some kids, because they're especially high in novelty seeking, which is genetically informed largely, or have had a traumatic childhood, you know, their environment was high risk. Those are more likely to try it and more likely to like it and more likely to develop habits. Hmm. And of course, this is not a hard line at 18. If you're 19, you're still in that zone of learning. So college years, another time associated with a lot of heavy drinking, correct? Absolutely. There is really a good uh, kind of almost linear relationship, though. The earlier you you are, the younger you are, the the more likely it is. Um, And and I think that it doesn't, you know, we talk about the time of brain maturity, maybe around 25, but it's not like it's a cliff, you know, and you're no longer plastic. We can we can learn until the day we die and you could become a problem user, you know, as a 70 year old. It happens but your chances are much higher the younger you are. Mm -hmm. And what are we talking about in terms of how much? Because I would say, I don't know the stats, but a good percentage of teenagers will use some sort of substance. So are we talking any amount? Are we talking like a moderate amount or a severe amount? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a little out on a limb here, but I'm pretty sure you have to be wasted. 
you know, if you're just sipping wine with your family, you probably wouldn't get it to your brain in appreciable measure anyway. So, uh, but here's, here's a statistic about that. Um, if you start, if you get drunk before you're 18, your chances are one in four of developing an alcohol use disorder. If you wait till you're 21, just three years, your chances are one in 25. Is it correlation versus causation there? Because some people are more apt to be attracted to escape or that kind of lifestyle? Totally love that question. What a, what a good science question. Perfect. Um, well, I used to think so because like you said, some people are risk takers. And so, you know, those who are going to smoke cigarettes or drink alcohol are also more likely to try heroin later. But in the animal studies, we see that that's not the case, that using addictive drugs early on, even uh, kind of briefly during this adolescent period of high plasticity, makes the reward system, for instance, less sensitive. And so, uh, so let me be more specific. If we give a, a rat or a mouse uh, a few exposures to any mind-altering drug, nicotine, THC, alcohol, uh, anything, and then we let them grow up normally and um, test them as adults, they'll self-administer more cocaine, more heroin, more alcohol, more THC. And we think, and we can see actually that the mesolimbic dopamine system, which is this uh, part of, this, it's a small set of neurons that contribute to all addictive disorders, is less sensitive in those adults who were exposed as adolescents. So it's almost like listening to the music too loud. And, uh, and we know this in psychology really well, that experience has an impact but it has a different impact depending on the timing. And these are critical periods. So it turns out to be a critical period for reward sensitivity during adolescence, which is perfectly designed for our evolutionary success, but um, also, you know, kind of a problem if you're, uh, because you're, like you say, you're more likely to try it then. Some kids more likely than others, from a biological or environmental influence, but all children are more susceptible than, you know, adults. So what are parents supposed to do? Do you write about that or think about that? So I, I, I think about it all the time. I raised three kids. Uh, my youngest is 20 in a sophomore in college. And, uh, I do. I did what all parents did, maybe with uh, a little more emphasis on showing graphs because I'm a scientist. So I was constantly, uh, my, my kids would just roll their eyes at the dinner table because we were talking about the science as it was coming. And as probably most parents know, information is not what changes people, unfortunately. I guess we all know that by now. But um, so I used a combination of carrots and sticks and, um, I, let's say I, so for instance, I promised, I told my kids about, you know, for every year you can wait to get drunk before you're 21, your chances of becoming an alcoholic are reduced by about 7%, which to me is, you know, that's gold information. By the way, I'm a recovering alcoholic, so I started when I was 13, so I know. Um, anyway, and I, I tried to say, uh, if you can wait till you're 21, I will buy you a round trip ticket anywhere, and you'll be able to enjoy alcohol. I mean, that is, should be a good incentive. I wish I could, you know, throw back a margarita on a nice sunny day or something, but that's off the table for me today. Um, I drank my share. So I was trying to protect my kids from that, and it didn't really work so much. Uh, they, none of them at the moment, I think, would qualify as having a substance use disorder, but they have both biological and, of course, environmental, because it's everywhere, uh, catalysts. And uh, so here's, so those were carrots, and here's a stick that I used, which is um, 
really kind of hypocritical because I smoked my way through my adolescence. I chain smoked marijuana. Now it wasn't anything near as potent as it is today, but I really loved it. And my youngest was getting ready to go to college. And I think I was projecting according to her, but I, uh, I said to her, terrible thing, you, you're 18, you know, you're obviously, I can't stop you from doing what you're going to do, but I am not going to pay your tuition. Your dad and I are not going to pay your tuition if you test positive for THC. I know you're raising your eyebrows. That was, that was pretty, uh, a big deal. And she was furious. You know, here she is 18. She's going to Colorado where it's legal. You know, she wanted nothing to do with me or her dad at that point. She felt fully entitled. And, um, but she said this, I, she's probably wiser than I was. She said, I don't like that at all, but I guess it's fair. And so she's having this fabulous uh, country club experience at a great school, you know, and we're happily paying. And uh, I don't know if she's binge drinking or doing other things. You know, I, I, I'm constantly talking about that too, but I have an easy way to test for marijuana now. Oh, so I thought it was just that she just had to get one clean test and then you'd, you'd pay the rest. No, she's got a, she's going to the lion's den where it's legalized and she can't partake at all. Well, so I didn't, I'm not so uh, naive to say, you know, forever. And so I, I did it kind of a semester at a time. And actually she's about to finish up her fourth semester. She's as a result, so what she did, I said, how is this? She said, you know, mom, it's so awkward because everybody smokes. They smoke more than they drink. And I said, what do you say? And she said, I say that my parents test me. And usually when she says that, she tells me people are a little high. And so they look at her like she's, you know, got six heads. And uh, she just kind of rolls her eyes and says, you know, and they feel sorry for her, I guess. But she said in a way in the beginning, it was kind of an easy out because she made the conscious choice and she knew we weren't kidding and we weren't. Um, I mean, I feel, as I said, I feel kind of hypocritical because I was, I did get thrown out of three schools by the end of it, you know? So, but I just, I was trying to protect her. It's almost, and I also said, you know, and in fact, she's going to be 21 in the fall and she's got pretty, uh, solid ground i think she's on pretty solid ground so and, and you can't protect people from living and i don't want to really create a you know a state where i'm overseeing my adult children so i, I don't think it'll go on forever but she did get a good start and she as a result found the two or three people on campus who aren't smoking regularly and those are her friends and She's uh, heading off for spring break today, exactly, as a matter of fact. Well, I think this is both encouraging and scary or demoralizing to parents because on one hand, to hear you, an expert who knows everything and even has what I would say is style that I would recommend parents have with kids, which is instead of using moralistic language and absolutist language, which kids will often code as, well, there they go again, and there's nuance to that. I know that, but they're not saying that, so I'm going to disregard everything they say. You're just giving them the data, and it's within their best interest. And of course, they don't want to become addicted to a substance. They don't want to become dependent. They don't want to have negative consequences either. So if you give them the data with the graphs and the science and it's solid, then it at least gives them an opportunity to make a choice for themselves. And uh, in all likelihood, they might choose, choose to do the healthy thing. But on the other hand, you're saying that it's also hard and you didn't get a lot of buy-in from them and you don't really know necessarily <laughs> the experiment so to speak is still in progress and for the parents they might feel like well if the scientist mom can't manage to <laughs> influence a, a child's behavior with all her knowledge and all of her calm discussions then how can I possibly affect my my teenager's behavior? It's just this overwhelming experience. So, what do you say to that? Wow, I I uh, you really said it well there. 
I, I'm empathetic. I think it is such a hard time to be a kid. Unbelievably hard. There's so many depressed and anxious and there's so much, um, so many ways to escape and those ways are much more powerful and accessible than they were when I was a kid. So it is a minefield. I, I think um, like you implied, kids do not really respond, especially the ones who are prone. So I, I mentioned novelty seeking, but another innate tendency of people who develop problems is low harm avoidance and low respect for authority for that same reason. So the very kids for whom you're telling them, you know, this is against the law or no, 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 or I don't want you to do this. Those are the ones who are likely to say, no way, who cares? You know, I mean, who does it stop that we shouldn't speed? You know, there's people who are gonna, so the laws are useless, more or less, especially in the people who would most benefit from following them. And um, so I I tried with some kids, and I, I think this is worthwhile if you can really get them to see it. You will be able to enjoy the benefits of mind altering drugs as an adult much more if you restrain yourself during this really critical period of brain development. And I think the mature kids will see that, but also we need, and this is, I think, a failure in parents and in communities and in society in general. We need to provide alternatives for kids to take risks, rush, you know, have adrenaline rush, uh, try new kind of dangerous, ridiculous things, go out on a limb. And if we, you know, that's what they're built for. And if they're built that way, and the only thing they can find is somebody offering them a pill in the lunchroom of their boring, you know, long day of tedious classes, then then it's our fault. You know, we, we say that kids can't be responsible because their brains aren't fully developed, but we are asking them to, you know, what, just say no? That was something around when I was a kid. I, I think it's, it's, not, um, it's not possible. So we have to have other things. I don't know if it's rock climbing or mountain biking, and it, it can't be all physical stuff either because they're not that way, but making music, making art, uh, existential philosophy, travel. You know, I had this one idea, <laughs> this is kind of off the wall, but um, if we could take every, say, uh, 13 or 14 year old or 15 year old and twice send them on a two week trip during that period, one to a third world country where they did something useful and one to a first world country where they saw that, you know, maybe their way isn't the only way. Um, that is novel, it's risky, it's challenging who they are, which is kind of what they're supposed to be about as they find their identities. And I think it would save a lot of money in the long run. Yeah, it almost makes you think 18 shouldn't be the cutoff date for adulthood. It should be like 21 or 25. So. You said you were thrown out of schools. How do you get kicked out of three schools for substance use? Well, it was probably a bad sign when I got kicked out of Girl Scouts in third grade. Um, and I wasn't using any drugs then, but I, I tended to be high on the challenging authority and risk taking, which is the Girl Scout incident. But in 10th grade, I was in a uh, parochial school and spiked the punch. I had discovered alcohol by then. I, I had my first good drink at about 13, just about 13, not, not even well into it, and changed the whole trajectory of my life. I, I really um, loved the feeling alcohol gave me so much, and I was off to the races. As I say, I just, I just took as much of any chemical I could get my hands on for the next 10 years. So anyway, in 10th grade, they asked me to leave this parochial school. And then I got kicked out of two colleges for not showing up and, you know, bad grades, but those were drug related also. I was, uh, my first college, my, my mother filled out my applications and uh, 
So I ended up in college, but I was mostly, um, that was in the time of, it was free base cocaine. So right before crack, but I was, you know, hanging out in the hood, not going to classes and got kicked out of there. And then one more. So I, by the time I was 23, I not only had that, but I was, I had contracted hepatitis from sharing dirty needles. Nobody liked me. I didn't like myself. Um, I thought that drugs though were the solution to my problem. So that seemed like the only good thing about my life was escaping it. <laughs> and I, uh, I ended up in a treatment center. This was in the 1980s. So, you know, ancient history, but I was, I, I thought treatment might be something like a spa and I thought I deserved a break and, uh, you know, things were crazy. And so I went without having any idea what I was getting into. They, they say you have to kind of hit bottom, but I had no idea. But what happened was I, I went to this place, it was in the middle of nowhere, and I was kind of stuck there. And I figured, um, wow, I'm screwed now. This is not, you know, there's no pedicures here. Not that, anyway, so I, I figured I'm going to get through it and I'm going to solve. They, they were telling me at this treatment center that I had a disease that was killing me. And if I wanted to live, I needed to be abstinent. And I wanted no part of abstinence because, as I said, I was at the place where people like me get where I didn't want to live without drugs, but I wasn't going to live with them either. And I could sort of see that that might be the case. So, but I figured there should be a back door. There always was another way. So I thought I'm going to, if I have a disease that's killing me, I'm going to cure the disease. I thought it would take me seven years. I have to laugh at myself. And, uh, I'm not sure why I thought that, but I thought it would take me seven years. I would cure it. And then I would be able to use without self-destructing. I was not all that smart. I, I was so as determined as every addict is. <laughs> And I, you know, don't tell me. So I, for some reason, and I was only 23, which going back to the argument about plasticity, I think was really in my favor. I had just turned 23. So I do think my brain was still flexible enough that at the same time I was doing every following directions about how not to pick up, I was also pursuing my education, which was, you know, it took me seven years eventually to get my bachelor's, another seven to get my PhD, and then I did a postdoc. And somewhere in there, this time period came and went, and I thought to myself, well, my life is about a trillion times better. Maybe I won't pick up now. But I could not see that at the beginning. So um, I have been clean and sober now for uh, almost uh, 36 years, 35 years. Yeah, I know, something. And just side note, after the inpatient treatment, did you do follow-up ongoing treatment? I did, I did 28 days inpatient, which was hell, and then three months in a halfway house, which was 20 times worse. It was, it was absolutely terrible because the whole point of it, I think, was to learn how to live without picking up. And it was, it saved my life for sure. Um, and I guess lots of things and people and opportunities saved my life. I had, I had support. Um, but this halfway house was called Progress Valley and that kind of says it all. Were you mandated to go? Not ex No, I was not. So uh, my mother had had a court order since I was in high school. My parents argued and argued about it. I kind of got tricked into, um, I wasn't tricked. I thought I was going for a break. I didn't have any idea. I was so confused. As I said, I, I used everything I could find. And so I was pretty cloudy. Um, and I think what happened when I got there is, I mean, I write about this in the book, if you want the whole gory story, but essentially I saw myself for an instant, more or less as I was, and I was scared enough to be willing to give it seven years. And I, you know, the fact that I was able to make it seven years is really due to a lot of the support I got and the halfway house. So it wasn't like I was just, you know, pulled myself up out of my bootstraps or anything. It was, it was tough. And sometimes it still is tough, actually. You know, it's not like um, society is so organized 
around escape and I'm a natural escape artist, I think. So I've had to learn lots of ways of coping, but anyway, yeah, no, I, um, it was a long haul. I went back to school and what I did in psychology actually, uh, was I took my compulsive, obsessive kind of nutty energy and a, made note cards <laughs> and studied and put it towards experimentation. And funny thing, I think the, um, what ended up making me a good scientist, maybe in some ways a great scientist, are the same attributes that made me a really bad addict. You know, I'm, I like to go out on a limb. I don't mind taking risks. I have a high tolerance for, for failure and for uh, punishment, you could say. I mean, that's helpful in science. And, uh, you know, I just, I put myself out there. And so I, I think that there's a lot of capital being lost in people like me because the opportunities that I had aren't so widely available. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a break. When we get back, let's continue talking. So when you think about you and the neuroscience of how you developed addiction, you can't know, of course, but I'm guessing that you've written about it or thought about it in terms of the genetics, the environment, and obviously you you got drunk when you were quite young, so you already know the answer to that question in terms of a risk factor. What are your thoughts on the other factors that contributed? Yeah, um, I probably had about an average risk for from the genetic side. I have a few people in my extended family with problems, but I was raised in a very, you know, nice looking family anyway. I mean, there was some probably depression and anxiety under the covers, but for the most part, my life looked pretty idyllic. I'm upper middle class. I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey. My dad was an airline pilot. My mother was a nurse, you know, looked good. And then uh, no big, big trauma. Although as we know, um, adverse childhood experiences are really common. And so I, but I probably had probably less than average there, but I was, uh, I do think that I haven't done my, uh, you know, 23 and me or anything. Um, but I have a strong feeling I could predict some of the variants that I might've had. And I also think that, you know, my parents were not in a happy marriage necessarily. They ended up divorcing right after I got sober, funny thing. Once the scapegoat was gone, you know, then things sort of fell apart. But uh, I think um, I would say, if anything, I was average, but maybe even had more um, less risk than than most people. But I was in this random experience. I was at a girlfriend's house, and she said, uh, "Hey, do you want to try some of the wine in my parents' basement?" And we drank a half a gallon uh together and i drank most of it i'm sure she ended up pretty normal i think she didn't develop a problem it was her first time too and i was on fire you know i really i felt like um a racehorse getting out of the gate i mean i there was not going to be stopping me so from that point on i i was pretty reckless very reckless got into a lot of trouble didn't stop me um, and i'm still not really moved by the risk of you know, punishment. <laughs> well, so when I hear that, I think, well, wow, things are to some extent kind of up to chance. It's just a matter of risk factors and protective factors. We can't predict who is going to develop an addiction. And from your description, then you would have been at low risk. And, and uh, the likelihood of you developing a serious problem wasn't really there, and yet you still did. So, you know, we're always talking about averages and, and this sort of thing. But it makes me wonder about what was happening more underground in your family. And of course, you don't have to answer this question, but I am curious as to how much attunement you might, because I talk a lot about attachment, and I find that often, and of course, it, it's a post hoc analysis that sometimes I'm just shoehorning in the data or cherry picking to fit my model, but I often find it useful or, I don't know, coherent that a lot of kids who have been not attuned to enough, who are neglected essentially, but it's underground, it's not overt, 
the parents are there, the parents love them, but they're not paying attention, particularly uh, zero to five, as much as what would be healthy. Maybe those parents also came from a lack of attuned childhood as well, and it can be kind of normalized within certain cultures. And then for those kids, they are walking around with a fair amount of uncertainty or anxiety, you know, more fear responses, kind of an, a, a low buzz of anxiety constantly. And then you take a substance, alcohol being the way that it is, it can really subdue for the first time a 13-year-old's constant static buzz of anxiety, and they suddenly feel like they can relax. And of course, there's the buzz feeling, there's the lack of being inhibited and being able to socialize or a body. But you know, that feeling of it's just, you know, the similar pathway to opiate addiction, where someone is, you know, noticeable PTSD trauma, they get prescribed Percocet for their wisdom teeth. And for the first time, they're just like, whoa, I actually feel normal. I, I have a a similar experience with clients regarding low grade neglect. Did anything like that happen to you? Well, very. I would say very low grade. And I know uh, a bit about the attachment data. I, I will say that I think I did have good early attachment. I was the oldest of three. My mother, as I said, was a nurse and she was pretty devoted. She was home during that time. I got a fair amount of attention. And I think maybe that helped me later. You know, I do think solid, but neither of my parents um, were secure in themselves or uh, felt safe themselves. And so they couldn't really convey that. And so while everything looked good, I think they were very fragile. And, you know, kids have a way of knowing that unconsciously. I remember one day, um, so my, my father was gone a lot and he was, he was kind of fun when he was fun. And when he, when he wasn't fun, he wasn't violent or anything, but he was just not so much present. Um, and my mother, uh, so she, we were home and she was at the kitchen sink and I saw she was crying and I must have been maybe probably shortly before I started using actually. And I said, mom, what's wrong? And she looked at me and she said, she was kind of caught and she said, well, I'm just so happy. And I knew she was lying. I knew it. And the bottom fell out of my stomach because uh, it, it, I knew it all along, but, and now I knew that we were lying about it. And I just, I think it was devastating, but you know, so I didn't know I was anxious and I didn't know they were as you, as I suggested, I remember later seeing a um, plaque on the wall of a bar. This is much later. And it said, um, alcohol makes me feel like I'm supposed to feel when I'm not drinking alcohol. And that was totally my experience. So I didn't know I was anxious until I found the solution. And then I was like, wow, the hole is filled. And I, I actually thought this is how adults do it. This is how they get through life. Now I found the key. So um, I think I did, I, you know, who's not anxious in some ways, but it really did soothe, it was medicine. And then I found weed shortly after that. And that was even better because that was medicine for boredom and tedium and my annoying parents and, you know, the insecurity of trying to find a way as a grown up in a big world. So I, you know, and then cocaine, of course, was an antidote to boredom even more and gave it a little bit of a boost a little bit, you know, so I, I had a reason for everything, but um, yeah, I think I also want to say though that, and because I going back to the challenges that e either people who are young have or their parents, I don't know that I would have lived if I had, if I was 13 today and picking up. Things are so much more potent and so much more available. I mean, look at the vaping situation. You know, I started smoking at 12 or 13 because, you know, I could and I figured, you know, this is a way to get back at, I don't know who I was getting back at, but, you know, just to be a rebel, I guess. But 
it was it was hard to do. It's hard to find a spot. You know, we'd be behind you know restaurants and stuff. There's nowhere to go. Well, now you can vape, you know, at church practically. So I think that it's very hard not to, you know, you're going to pick up as a kid, you pick up and it does something. And that something is effective. And then your brain is changed to make you need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think about harm reduction? I think it's still harm. I mean, that's so certainly people need to live to get sober. They need to be alive. They need to be breathing. But um, I think harm reduction is not synonymous with wellness or recovery. And I think it sells people short. Honestly, I if you could have if you said to me in my treatment center, hey, you know, we have sort of mild versions of all the drugs you like, and you can kind of keep going, but you won't make such a fool out of yourself and attract so much attention. How does that sound? I would have been all in. Um, the fact that I had this kind of black and white choice was, um, and support was helpful. But what I worry about, so let me also say I was not an opiate addict. I took some opiates, but I didn't get my hands on enough of them to be really dependent. And I think this, uh, the harm reduction with opioids is wonderful. I think it's a key um, ingredient in a full life, but it should be an early ingredient that we titrate off of because it wasn't designed to be used forever. And what I notice is that instead of funding people's well-being in the t form of long-term treatment like I had, or dentistry, or um, the ability to get a student loan for college to fulfill dreams, or a place to live. A lot of the money in treatment is going to the drug companies rather than the things that we know work. And I find that disconcerting. You know, we know that support and time work, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, good uh, group counseling, uh, vocational therapy and rehab. All these things are beneficial, but they take time and money. And what are we doing with our time and money? I don't know about everywhere, but in Pennsylvania, the biggest portion of the um, opioid settlements are going to fund buprenorphine prescriptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think about psychedelics in treatment? There's a lot of research on that. Well, psilocybin, LSD, mescaline, DMT are not addictive. Um, now, MDMA is addictive, so I don't put that in the category of psychedelics that I would say are serotonin 2A receptor agonists, but I have a long thing on that in the book, and we could talk about that more if you want. But so they're not addictive. They may be helpful. What I worry about, though, and, and I think there is decent evidence, actually, of all the pharmacological interventions, I think the psychedelics have the most promise in my mind. And they're based on insight. Now, I sometimes wonder whether my ability to recover wasn't in some way influenced by using those drugs, because I could see some things about myself that were hard to see, but were true. And what's the case with addiction is that it's, it's based on lies we tell ourselves and other people about ourselves. And so the more truth, you know, the better. But I, I think it's a, it's a tool, not a path. And I, I notice a lot of young people thinking, oh, great, this is a path. It's not as destructive as even alcohol, which is legal. So, um, you know, I'm mindful about that. But I, I do think what we really need is human connection with ourselves and other people, connection to something bigger than ourselves, which is something that psychedelics can facilitate, and also um, support, you know? Yeah, I kind of... Another part of my podcast is I will react to reality TV. There's this show called 90 Day Fiance, and there are people that will 
go all over the world, there'll be a lot of mixture of cultures and different ideas of parenting. Of course, as a therapist myself, I did a fair amount of family work in my early career and would talk with a lot of couples, parents, and observe, but also just talk with them about how to parent better, how to integrate parenting differences. And of course, because of my own cultural pocket being from Seattle and uh, one of the most, I don't know if it's fair to say this, but one of the most passive, permissive parenting styles you could ever imagine in the world it exists in history and in time and place in the liberal America urban pockets where there's very little discipline, very little stern punishments. Of course, it can happen, but that's not the ideal. That's not what is held up. That's not what what's privileged. And when I watch this show and I see it, these other cultures, it at first is abhorrent to me that you'd have a parent in India, for example, that would basically discipline their child for the rest of their life. They could be 55 years old and their their mom is telling them what to do and, and emotionally punishing them for stepping out of some sort of cultural line, not dressing the right way, not marrying the right person, uh, not being of the right religion, not saying the right thing. Of course, to me, when I watch that, I just think that's horrible, but I try to step outside of my culture and myself and understand, you know, there's different ways of parenting, there's pros and cons. When I hear about your research and what you found, it kind of lends itself in that direction <laughs> away from the permissive parenting styles of, of my culture toward a more strict, restrictive parenting style where you literally never let them go to parties. You don't let them do overnights. You don't let them hang out with the bad kids. And I just wonder, like, are we heading in the wrong direction? Because I feel like it's getting even more permissive. And of course, there's pros to that of self-expression of children and allowing them to find themselves. And I just wonder, are we doing our young people wrong by uh, going in that direction? What do you think? I, I was grounded for most of my high school. My parents were very strict and rigid. And when I wasn't grounded, I made up for it. So I was not like your friend. I you know, when I was loose, I was really loose. So as a result, you know, they kicked me out when I was about 18. And I, I think that this is a hard balance to strike. Some kids are more likely to be accepting of restrictions than others. The ones that are less likely to accept them are also more likely to try drugs. So, you know, that that's a problem. I don't in general think that we are going to impact the epidemic of addictive disorders by punishment or restraint or control. I do not think so, which is why I'm so committed to education. But I, um, so I think it's a, it's a fine balance. I do think that never in history have there been more risky ways to take drugs though. So kids are gonna do it. And the stuff that's around, you hear about it all the time. You know, it just wasn't there. I, I took many pills, I had no idea what was in them, which is just stupid to me now, but you know, I'm like older. But at the time, you know, if you do that today, you might not wake up. So I think that um, we, gotta, we gotta be honest with kids. I think that what does maybe work is talking about ourselves and not about them. So I don't think it's effective to say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, even though, so, so what I did with my daughter, I said, here's your choice. But what I sort of more generally, what I think is helpful is to say, here's my fears. Here's what I worry about. Here's what I see. Here's what I hope. And then to just be with them. And I can remember with all three of my kids doing this, I, you know, there's a period during adolescence when they're just so prickly. Nobody wants to be around them. I don't think even themselves, you know. And so during that time, I would want to just go in my room and close the door too. But instead, I would say, let's sit out on the couch, you know, and they'd be grumbling and, um, you know, annoyance. And I would just sit there not saying anything. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes after a while, they would say, you know, so-and-so did this at school today. Or, you know, what do you think of this on TikTok? 
And in any way we can make bridges, I think it's, it's helpful. And be honest about our own selves. And, and really, uh, it's not a moral problem. It's not something that we can, we can control. We can't prevent addiction by, you know, force or tears. But I think we can do more to show up for each other, honestly. And that might help. Yeah, I mean, it certainly is a more hopeful image than what I was painting. You were mentioning earlier that you could really go on an interesting neurological tangent regarding, I believe you're talking about serotonin and agonists. Because this is a neuroscience book, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> we haven't really talked about. To please the, the neuro nerds in the audience, what are, what are three neuro nerd facts that you could throw on people from your book? Okay, well, there's really one core fact and um, I can talk about a hundred, but the, the most important thing to know about the brain is that it compensates for any mind altering drug that you take regularly. So to produce the exact opposite effect. So for instance, uh, if you take uh, a sedative like alcohol to relax and have fun regularly, you're going to become tense and anxious and not much fun. If you take a drug to wake up and get through the day, it's going to make you lethargic over time so that you need the drug to feel normal. If you take a drug to reduce suffering, you're going to be miserable. So if you take a drug to sleep, you're going to be an insomniac. So the, the brain likes homeostasis. It likes a balanced internal state. And it's infinitely capable of adapting. So whenever we perturb our affect, our feeling state, including things like arousal and pleasure and relaxation um, and pain states, the, the brain compensates for that over time, which is why we have tolerance. The drug works less and less well because not the drug is less effective necessarily, but the brain is better at counteracting it. We have dependence. So when we don't, we take the drug away, now we feel less well. We're, people who are regular users of any drug mostly use because it feels so crappy not to use, not to get high. I mean, regular opiate users haven't gotten high in a while. They're just trying not to be sick. Um, and those two things, tolerance and dependence, set up craving. So then we spend all our time and money and effort and health and, you know, trying to stay not sick. And so that's a sad, that's a sad thing. I mean, the big, yeah, with any drug, that's true. So that's the main point that the brain counteracts it and it counteracts it better, more effectively, if you're young when you start using. So that, that compensation is kind of built in to the hardware. The pathways in the brain get laid down in a way that reduces the effectiveness of those drugs, which means that in order to get high, you know, when you're 40, if you were using when you were 14, you need to take more. And you would feel worse at 25. So if you started at 14 and you're still using at 25, say alcohol, and you go for a couple of days without using alcohol, you'll feel even worse because you started early? So that, that's a hard experiment to do. In the animals, yes. And I can tell you my own experience. My husband says, uh, he has this thing about me, which is that I'm never satisfied. And um, I'm just not content. I, I don't, I think it's, you know, a weakness, but also a strength, I try to tell him, because it makes me write books and come on podcasts. But I do have a kind of restless discontent that um, might come from the fact that I, I never can have enough. You know, I, I'm sort of perpetually hungry. And I think, and that means maybe that the pleasure, you know, if you gave 100 people a pleasurable experience, I would find it less satisfying, which makes me always be pushing more. And I don't know that that's caused by what I did to my brain uh, early on, but it, it certainly is congruent with the uh, research. Mm -hmm. 
So earlier you were talking about the main point of the book is that you put any substance into the brain, it's going to learn how to counteract it and you know lower the effects, creating tolerance, but also creating the after effects, the, the come down, if you will, from the substance or the backlash. What about ongoing prescribed SSRIs or you know, psychostimulants for ADHD? Mm-hmm. Great question. Well, funny thing, the compensation that the brain does to SSRIs is the therapeutic benefit. And we know that because you take an SSRI and you don't feel better 20 minutes later, the first time you take it, right? What did the doctors say when they give you the prescription? It's going to take a couple of weeks. So it's actually the, the therapeutic reward is, is in the compensation. And that's a long, interesting story too. Um, for ADHD medication, it is the, so if you take it as prescribed and you're not supposed to take more than you need, um, then the rebound will be lower, but there is a rebound. There is some evidence that it's less easy to pay attention over time when you're not on it. And so if there's some advice that if you can start kids with other alternative ways of developing focus and they're effective, then that's preferable because they wouldn't have, you know, behavioral changes wouldn't have a rebound. No, I definitely want to say that ADHD is a big liability and it's really important to treat it. So, uh, but when you treat it, yeah, that there's a risk of that. And I'm not usually on this side of the anti-capitalist just talk about, you know, big pharma conspiracies, but in your research and in your writing, when it comes to the cycle or the system of, you know, meds being not only lobbied for and, and pushed on physicians, on prescribers, on treatment providers, incentives, this kind of thing, then you have this feedback loop where I don't know if this is what you're saying or this is what I'm just synthesizing for what you're saying is you have a bunch, say, a 13-year-old that's not doing well in school is conceptualized as having an executive function disorder and they are contemplating treatment and because of the influences and because of the quick fix and because the propaganda being given to teachers, administrators, and parents that um, there's one solution to this, which is a pill, and then the kid gets prescribed the pill and and maybe it's it's not a a bad script but it's the you know the main thing that's being used over and over again and then this also in the child's early development kind of would set them up it would be a risk factor for them basically according to what you're saying needing the substance for the rest of their life because it changes the brain as it's developing and say in a different world where they aren't prescribed that med maybe they figure out other ways to manage it if, it's, if they're given that support and those skills, maybe even their brain even develops. I mean, obviously it would, it would develop in a, on a different path. They're 25 years old and they don't need to take the medication or maybe they'd benefit a little bit, but not nearly as much as they would need it at 25 because they were given that substance when they were young. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I wanna give, I wanna give two answers because you really asked two great questions. So following up on that part of it, I do, um, you know, the incidence of ADHD is going up and up and up and up and up. And so we might want to ask why, you know, what is the cause rather than just how can we tamp this down? What what are we doing uh, to fix it? And I do think that it, it's clear that untreated serious attention deficits have a big cost for individual lives. They track kids into lower classes. They're less likely to go to good colleges or college at all. They'll make less money. They'll actually live less long and they'll, you know, because they eat less well, because they're less educated. So it's a problem. It's really important. But while we're throwing the medicine at it, the incidence is going up and we're really not maybe focusing so much on finding other ways to manage it. And I also think there are um, some liabilities to those drugs that we kind of ignore. So is it necessary that we all focus like a laser, you know, eight hours a day? And how is that going? Maybe not so great for everybody, but I'm not going to go there. I want to, I want to come back to the broader question, which is what is the role of pharmaceutical 
treatments in the pharmaceutical industry in general in dealing with addiction. And again, it's amazing to notice that we've spent, you know, a good uh, 50, 60 years developing, you know, doing neuroscience research and developing new treatments and flooding the market with these treatments. And your chances of developing an addictive disorder today are higher than ever. And your chances of dying of addiction today are higher than ever. So just those two facts, we have more drugs around to so-called fix it, but there's more incidents. So there's something wrong. And I think that I, I think that there is a place for pharmaceutical treatments, for sure, and that they should be pursued. But I don't think that they should be pursued to the um, detriment of other things. I think that we know a lot of things that help, you know, good counseling, a community, support, an opportunity for a decent job or to go to school, low stress. And those things are kind of, you know, given short shift because we're so busy just, you know, prescribing pills that on their face don't seem to be having a great impact. I mean, if the pills were so effective, we'd have fewer deaths, not more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, of course, easier to, quote unquote, easier to prescribe and to administer this. It requires a lot less behavioral change on the individual. It also, you can't make a lot of money if you are trying to sell the idea of trying to get support and exercise and eating better and pushing back on capitalism, working 70 hours a week, that kind of thing, more isolation, more pressure to pressure your kids to do well in school so they can participate in the capitalistic uh, machine. For the record, people will just, for my listeners, will say that I hate capitalism. Every form of government and society has its pros and cons. This is, I'm just highlighting the cons of the capitalistic system. That's all, that's all I'm saying, but interesting. So let's get back to SSRIs with that. I do remember a little bit of my neuro uh, professors talking about this, about with SSRIs, uh, the emerging model of understanding as to why us, because originally it was like the happy pill, right? The Prozac was, it makes you happy. And uh, over time, they found that that wasn't the case. And when they started looking at the neurological changes as to why SSRIs would work, the drug will make it so that the brain, it's open to change. So can you refute or clarify what I just said? So you just made a really good argument, by the way, for uh, psychedelic assisted therapy, because we're opening up pathways and new ways of seeing things, which I think those drugs are more effective at doing. The SSRIs are not all that effective. Much more effective is uh, aerobic exercise or electroconvulsive shock therapy. Yet, um, 30% of adults in many uh, countries are taking SSRIs, 20 to 30%. So they're like practically in our water. Why is that? You know, and, and depression is epidemic again, just like addiction. So we've got more depression than ever, more SSRIs than ever. We ought to wonder, you know, how is it going? Not so well. So I think depression is caused by a pat in essentially, in an essential way, a pathological response to stress a dysfunctional response to stress. And um, the cause of depression then is, is kind of too much stress and not enough support. And what that does over time is probably deplete serotonin, but also uh, you know shrink the hippocampus and reduce prefrontal cortical uh, activity. It, it's bad for neurons, stress is bad. So we know what helps with stress, don't we? Social support. Uh, aerobic exercise, uh, feeling a meaningful life, opportunities, you know, the opposite of learned helplessness. So feeling that you have some ability to affect your outcome. And those things, you know, don't require, don't cause compensation and they don't have rebound effects. Um, you know, there was a recent paper kind of interesting from uh, Sak uh, Sak uh, Barbara, oh, geez, I can't think of her name, it's Sahakian or something in uh, at Oxford, showing that uh, what really SSRIs are doing is they're kind of buffering 
everything. So it's like a little pillow around the lows and around the highs, which makes you less urgent. You know, sex is less compelling, eating in some ways. If you take high enough doses, you're less obsessive and compulsive. So do are we saying, therefore, that what we need to do is reduce people's sensitivity to the intensity of living? Or would it be maybe a better strategy to give them tools to help them cope with the intensity of living. Hmm. All right, let's take a quick break. And when we get back, we'll continue talking about this. So for someone taking SSRIs right now, and and does this this also play to SNRIs as well, this this discussion? So if someone's taking one of those compounds, and of, of which many people are, what would be a strategy for exploring their options forward, moving forward? So good question. While they're, so let me just say that there are a a substantial portion, not a majority of psychopharmacologists who think that SSRI's effectiveness is all placebo. Most don't think that. Most think that they are effective a little bit for a subpopulation of people who are depressed but they're not wildly effective as shown by the fact that so many people are on them and we have so much depression. What they do though, however, because of the compensation is that when you go off them, you will be depressed. So going off them is hell, which is going back to the capitalist thing, perfect for the drug companies. They're kind of not toxic. You can be on them forever and ever, and they're not really going to hurt you, but unless you go off, I mean, this is, almost as good as nicotine addiction. Um, and, and why should you go off, you know, so the doctors give them and, and, you know, we're taking them like crazy. But um, I would say that you're gonna feel depressed going off. So the only way well, so there's two, two um, views on this. One is knowing that and going cold turkey and getting it over with. Again, not something to do on your own, you know, in a cabin in the middle of winter. Uh, Another way is to slowly, over a year or two, kind of reflecting how long you've been on them, go down. But as you mentioned, at the same time, amping up your emotional and cognitive and other kinds of support, you know, finding new hobbies, taking up exercise. So it's a long haul. And, and really, you know, I think I could go back to this is a little off topic from addiction, but we want to ask, why are we all depressed? What is it? You know, and, and if we all, you know, statistically, it's actually normal to be depressed, which means it's not abnormal to be depressed, which means, you know, it's so prevalent and we're just trying to find new ways to treat it. But really, we just should ask why, especially in a country like the US or in a place like Seattle, you know, kind of doesn't get that much better. Why are we all in despair? Why are we? Oh, wow. Well, that is way outside my scope. I think that answering that question is something that we should collaborate on. I'll give my two cents. But I think that we are alienated from ourselves and from each other and from things that matter. And we're alienated because it's painful. And like uh, we said before, if you, if you block the pain, you kind of also block the joy. So I think we don't uh, have enough models, especially um, adult effective models for coping and grappling with the pains of living. Meaning that we don't have models to follow in their example. We don't have people to show yeah. us the way. That- yeah, show, to show us a way. So I don't know that there's the way, but you know, even if you're a parent, let's say, who's not drinking from your wine box every night? Are you, you know, busy scrolling through social media or binge watching TV or, or what do we do to cope? And, you know, there's a lot that we need to cope 
from, you know, it's not, it's not easy. And I think that what, what the, um, maybe the strategies of modern medicine have been like, hey, it's not easy, but we can fix that, but we can fix that, but we can fix that. And I think that's a lie. I think it's not easy. So in that case, what, how can we support each other in showing up for the way it is? You use themes of support and together. Are you talking about actual like hanging out together and crying and, and laughing with each other? Is, is that what you're talking about? Well, I think, yes, I think we evolved in social groups. I think we're dependent on uh, others for finding ourselves. For, like, I don't think I exist away from other people. And I, you know, there's really interesting neuroscience data, some of your listeners might know, that shows that our brains converge, the neural activity uh, comes together, gets synchronous with other people that are close by us. And that if we agree, we come into agreement, in other words, in this way, by proximity, sharing our ideas, listening to each other, and the brain activity reflects that. So I think we're meant to be connected. And I think that in many ways, modern society um, uh, undermines those connections. You know, we got a lot to do, we're busy, we don't even know our neighbors in some cases. Our kids are, uh, you know, not eating dinner at the same time and place. It's, you know, there's just, it's overwhelming, I think. So I, I do think that that's going to be part of the solution. And for me, in my own recovery, you know, it ended up that what I had to do was face myself, which I was only able to do with the support of other people. And then I used resources that were outside me um, to kind of climb out of the hole. I didn't do it on my own at all. Yeah, it's interesting because whenever I talk with experts on the podcast or I go in depth on some article that seems to be completely outside of my area, like neuroscience, I think I'm going to hear a lot of things that are going to blow my mind and I will hear things that I don't understand and I'll, I'll be very interested in the science, but it always seems to come back to this, what, what you're saying, which is that we're moving more and more away because the listeners of my podcast will know I've yammered exactly basically of what you were just saying often, uh, but more from the attachment and I, side of things, but also at mood and lifestyle and evolution and all likelihood we grew up and died with the same 50 people and they were within ear and eye shot 99 percent of the day we slept literally up against them probably and in today's world that's considered low class you want a giant house you want your own car you want your own office you don't want to know your neighbors as you say uh, collaboration with others is considered weird and you should have your own vacuum cleaner and, and you should have your own washing machine and you uh, it's all this effort of getting away from people <laughs> americans it's like I, I don't want to see other people I, I i hate other people i don't want to go to the store i'm going to have amazon deliver it and i don't want to go to the theater i'm just going to stream it from my phone while i'm laying in bed and it's just more and more isolating and uh, i think that is why we're suffering so greatly and to hear from you, someone who's looked at all the neuroscience and that's what you've taken away from it is, uh, you know, scary to the listeners because it gives me even more reason to yammer and to rant about this because I often will. <laughs> and it's hard, though, because what's the solution exactly, right? Because I, I think about for myself, I mean, I have all those things. I, I have my own car. I have my own office. So what's the solution? You know, I, it, I think it... Um, Every it's it's habits it's little things like um, like my impulse is like I wonder if I need to be cuddling with my wife more often essentially you know um, if if I need to slow down and work less um, if I need to reach out to that friend and go for a walk or something or or instead of getting something on Amazon just go to the store and you know deal with parking I suppose but enjoy other humans uh, have some small talk with the cashier that's appropriate I don't know just some kind of push in that direction you know we don't have to become 
a, a cult member and like live in the woods and dance naked around a fire necessarily you know like we can do little things to our life to go in that direction do you think about that I do. I, I became a neuroscientist because I thought I was going to find the faulty gene or chemical or pathway and fix it, my addiction. And I've learned that more than anything else, addiction is a disorder of alienation and that recovery is a process of connecting with myself, with other people, and with things that are bigger than me. And I, I think, you know, if you talk to any addict, their world is tiny. It's basically them and their need, you know, and this is a, I think this is the way out. I, I, I you know, wrote the book. Um, in fact, I wasn't sure how it was going to end because I was still sort of hopeful, like just around the corner, you know, surely we're going to have some big breakthrough. And I'm a scientist, so there may be the data that support that, you know, somebody might discover the secret pill. But I don't think so. I think, uh, I think that, you know, there wasn't a lot of addiction before industrialization. There was some, but there wasn't. And there's two main reasons for that. There wasn't so much access to drugs, but there was also, um, well, and not as much angst in a way. So, and, and part of the reason the access was limited was because people used in groups. They had, they celebrated together the harvest or the wedding or the funeral or whatever, but, you know, not like today where we close our blinds and we sit home with our, our bong or our TV show or whatever and, you know, try to take care of ourselves. I, I just think that is not, um, and, and in a way, taking a pill is another version of, you know, take care of this yourselves. I don't think the causes are inside our heads. And I don't think the um, solution is either. Hmm. Well, it's a great message. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Dr. Judy Grizel. Can you tell everyone your, your book again and sure. where to find it? Yeah, the book is called Never Enough, The Neuroscience and Experience of Addiction. And I'm also working on a new one, hopefully on kids and cannabis. Uh, but that will be a while. So uh, yeah, if you read the book and have questions, reach out to me at Bucknell University in Pennsylvania. Okay. So your at your email address is what? Is uh, J dot Grizel G R I S E L at Bucknell dot edu or Judy dot Grizel at Gmail. But those kind of get buried. So if it's a if it's a science question or a question about the book or addiction probably safer to use my professional address. And I'm not big on social media. I keep having people find me through my email just because uh, I like real connections, not the virtual ones so much. So feel free to write. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself. Dr. Judy, why should people take care of themselves? Because no one else is going to do it. <laughs>